I just sent a copy of a comment that was done under the last video that we should discuss. And this guy is very critical of us, and he's calling we're snake oil salesmen, and we don't know what we're talking about. What he has done here is he has pulled down an updated file where he copied and pasted stuff. This is on uh, the Artemis program. Yes. This is Orion, right? And when I was making comments in the last video that there was a 486 chipset in Orion, Robert and I looked it up, and Kelly Smith video, he was talking about the speed of the computer, which is the same as what was put into the space shuttle. Kelly Smith said that the speed was 480 million times per second. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not even a 486, but you're going to go to 486 because that's the next number up. This is expected. The communications link we have through satellites to Orion is momentarily lost. But Orion continues to receive and process data. Its computers can handle 480 million instructions per second. I believe when I was listening to one of the presentations on the uh, space shuttle from the British Interplanetary Society, that he was talking about the updated on the computer. I think it was, he was talking about the 1991 space shuttle where they had updated it to the 486 chipset on there, and it was the first use of digital communications on there. I don't recall the gentleman's name, but it is on the British Interplanetary website, that the presentation that was done there on it. What this gentleman has done, this William Mann, is he is taking the new snake oil and fluff that NASA is doing because he even copied and pasted the part of the article in there, which was written by Zach Werner Flinger, and it shows that it was published in 2014 and updated July 21st, 2022. And now they're saying that they're using a power PC from IBM, a 750X single core processor, right? And that came out in around 2002 on the thing. But that is not what the original documentations. See, when people are making comments under the video and they're reading updated fluff and NASA is continuously updating their files, yep. why do they need to update a file? Do you file data correct the first time or are they just trying to cover their ass when they make mistakes or when they have information out here that they put out and they're going to update it to say, no, we're better than that, that we're using the newest technology. Orion does not have the latest technology. In it. Yeah, but now you got to make sure that you identify the two. You have Orion and you have Artemis. Yeah, but what I was talking about was Orion 2014 flight. And they turn around and they put all this stuff in here. NASA had to update the file on Orion. Well, pretty soon, the thing, it won't have any problems by the 2014 flight. None, nothing about the heat shields. They'll all be updated and everything else. You know, they're back to using the original heat shields from the Apollo era. <laughs> on it, right? And somehow they're going to have to claim that that's their newest and greatest technology. And if that fails, then where are they going to go? Because they don't have any other technology. But this is just an example. And this guy, well, he's commenting about the two of us, you and I, Marcus, that we're snake oil salesmen. Yeah. Right? I wonder what the snake oil is that we're selling. He says, I have commented many times in the past on what fluff and bad history you two have. Well, He's using an updated file. Go back to the original file where we gathered the information. Yeah. Because that's exactly what they state. And the reason why they're doing it is to confuse these people. And if this man wants to enjoy himself instead of watching our videos, what he should be doing is just putting in cats on a keyboard or watching a little TikTok stuff, right? Because he has no reason to be here and thinks that he knows something when he's only reading a small portion. And this is what people are doing with the Apollo missions. They're just taking all of that information and somebody says, oh, well, we went and everything worked, right? Wasn't a problem to go through the belts. So this wasn't a problem, everything. And it was just luck. And people okay. believe that. Yeah, they do, because NASA's telling them. You throw enough shit against the wall, some of it's going to stick. That's what NASA is doing. Billions of dollars they're spending to change the files to confuse people. And of course, tomorrow, Artemis is on the launch pad scheduled for tomorrow, right? I think they'll have another delay. 
I'm looking at the solar events to see if, the, if there's another one. And this is what you encounter, and people, they take one little piece of information and they have formed an opinion. And they think they're right, and they get other people that have very little information and have formed an opinion, and they think they're right. Because they do so little information or searching for the truth, they think that we don't work any harder on it. We understand the subject, we have knowledge about the subject, we know the history of the subject, we know what's been said for and against it. And somebody coming on to challenge us would have to be very, very well informed to be able to do so, to do so convincingly. It's very easy to insult somebody. But I can say that anybody calling us a snake oil salesman is a complete idiot because they don't know what they're talking about. They really don't. The person you've been responding to, Dave McKeon, yeah. Right? I was surprised that he responded back and you saw what I sent him for images. Yeah, I did. Because I sent both of you a copy on it. Apollo 12 does it, but Apollo 14 does it better. There's the shadow that I, I sent him. Of course, his excuse is that it was being shot through a window. And if it's being shot through the window to create a double image, then why is only the shadow a double image? Why isn't the entire photograph a double image? Yeah, good point. And of course, in other uh, videos we've done, uh, I was talking about them moving and adjusting the lights to get them into focus. And yeah. here's an example, because now the shadow is off at the top. This is the first photograph, and there's no double image over here. The, only the double image is there. If it's being shot through a window, I mean, I, I guess you could adjust the, the angle so it shoots through double pieces of glass, but it's only the shadow is being affected. And that must be one very unique piece of glass only to affect the shadow. And of course, now it's at the top. Now it's off to this side. You see, everything else is clear here. Nothing wrong with the reticules on there. And then here again, I'm just going through the sequence of these are in order. Nice and clear here double image. Tell me, Scott, do you know if the windows in the lunar module, are they double paned? Yes. Well, if they are, then it should apply to all the image. That's right. If the camera lens through two pieces of glass were causing a double image, everything in the photograph would be a double image. Now, why are there no double images on those crater rims? And now you see there's only just a little hair across this side on this one. Yeah, they're changing sides completely. Yeah. yeah, the only thing that would cause it would be if you've got multiple lighting and you're adjusting it. Yeah, but surely if there was a um, double image coming up here because of two panes of glass, you'd get the same effect. Everything would be through. Yeah, and you'd get the same effect on the film, which was shot through the same window. The Myra 16mm film camera shot through that window. So why don't we get a double image on the film, which we don't? That shadow changes from left to right to the right. You yeah, see here, if you come up a little bit, there's a little bit of reflective image from the window. That's on the window. You're seeing a little bit whatever's inside back there on. But everything else is clear. I mean, that hazes it a little bit. But there's the bloody shadow. And everything is clear. There's no distortion down here at all. No double images. And it's right down to here. Like, this is all the way from the very bottom all the way up. This is the type of things that people just say, well, it's through a window. Well, obviously it's not. And a single light source cannot do this. One of the astronauts standing outside with his bright white spacesuit is not going to be able to create this. Some of the comments that are being made, and I realize these people want to believe and do believe that man landed on the moon, right? But when you take someone that, that's using a camera and like, of course, he's not using a, a film camera in any of his stuff. And there are great differences between the two on the thing. If the uh, double pane of glass is going to create a double image, then it wouldn't matter whether you're using film or digital or whatever. It's going to be there. What other explanation can you have? Because it's the light sources then that are now moving. And anybody that set any stage production up, I don't care if you're in high school and you're adjusting the lighting and you wanted to create a nice solid image on the stage if you're using shadows on a back wall or whatever and you're doing that for your effect. 
even high school kids would be able to figure it out. But of course, one point that most people seem to uh, totally overlook, mainly because they don't understand it, A, it's the uh, Hasselblad cameras we're using photographic film. And we now know that photographic film cannot operate unpressurized in a vacuum. We've tested it. You've done it. You've demonstrated a photographic film is affected, especially at a low level of vacuum, like the level that you were using, Tor 10 to the minus 3, because to get a more expensive vacuum chamber was a bit out of the question. And it wasn't really necessary because we demonstrated the problem, as you can see in the pictures behind you. Photographic film is affected by vacuum. Tor 10 to the minus 3 is relatively low vacuum. That's the Kármán line, that's 60 miles above the Earth's surface. And this is the point that many people overlook, that in order to get photographs on the lunar surface, assuming anybody got there, but let's, let's say for the sake of argument that somebody did get there, and they use the Hasselblad camera, which we've seen in many of the photographs, we know what it looks like, we know what it can do, it was not pressurized. If it had been, we'd have seen it. So every photograph taken allegedly on the lunar surface was not taken there, it was taken here on Earth. But you don't need a pressurized camera because the film is designed to work in an atmosphere. This is what we were looking at yesterday, was it? Day before yesterday. Yeah. Went through a bunch of those different photos and you have a whole stack of these photos that there's no reticules on them. And then all of a sudden the reticules back and then on another magazine they're all gone again, and then on another half of a magazine, they're, they're back. The Resua plate has those screws on them that are all rusted up. Yeah. So how do those astronauts, how are they able to take those screws out of that Resua plate and then just toss it aside and say, oh, well, we're just going to take some photos? Or did they have a Hasselblad camera there that did not have a Resua plate? And then here's the second part of this problem, is that... The magazine is made for the Hasselblad 500C camera. Therefore, you cannot just clip it onto a Maurer DAC camera. It will not fit. <laughs> it won't work either. There are no electrical links, no mechanical links. I figured that some of the photographs from orbit, which would have been done in some kind of a studio, but that's not what they claim. Of course, you're going to look at these and you're going to see no reticules in here whatsoever. I'll just go down through a few of them here, and then you get the inside shots, no reticules. And this is all on Magazine 36, so everything in Magazine 36 do not have reticules. And then you get into Magazine 37, and that's, of course, the anomaly where the CSM is below the LEM, which never happened. But you see there's no reticules there. And when you come down, you hit all these ground photographs as well, right? This is in 37, no reticules. And you come down, you hit magazine 39 here, and you go in 13 photographs. So there's the very first one, that's magazine 39, 5750, is the first one with reticules. Yep, definitely, okay. you can see them definitely there. I'm going to pull 49 up here. There's the two of them side by side. Like this is 49, this is 50. And I'm sure if you go to the journal site, there's only a minute or so between the taking the photographs. Actually, they look like they're taken right in sequence. If you're looking at these two photographs, right? Yeah, there's a slight difference between them. But that's the full frame. I'm just looking at the image down here. One shows a little more of the shadow than this one does. That's right, yeah. So they've just moved it. But all of a sudden, now you've got reticules. Well, that shouldn't happen on the same camera. Either the camera will have reticules because it's screwed into the camera itself. It's not in the magazine, it's in the camera. So exactly, and those screws you're looking at there, it would take a fair bit of time. And don't forget, they never had a screwdriver on board. If you look at their equipment kit on the thing, the only thing they had was the tool to open the door for the CSM from the outside if they couldn't get in. Yep. They had a few things to help tighten the door if it didn't seal. I doubt if you used a little brush to make sure that the dust was taken off the door. That brush was in the equipment in the uh, descent stage of the LEM, and so is that handle. That's funny, the handle to get back on the CSM is stored down on quadrant four. 
right, where the camera is, right in there, and the brush and all that other stuff in there. But their tools that they had on board the thing, other than the uh, void bolt, the hammer, and the uh, grasping tools and stuff like that, there's no listing for screwdrivers or anything else or wrenches, even the PLSS. If they have to change the battery and it's fully inside this case where you have to take a bunch of stuff off, they need to have tools to do that, to change the battery out. Yeah, what about the OPS? There's a battery in there as well. Yeah, and there's no way to get at that either. But the tools simply aren't there. And it's clearly listed on the site. I mean, they can update it and say that they had a whole bunch of, you know, screwdrivers and wrenches and, you know, clamps, you you name it. But they didn't have them. The original PDF files, and I have read those carefully, do not have that equipment. What we're looking at here is Magazine 37, and we're looking at the last orbital photograph here. No reticules on there. There's the lamb, of course, way above the CSM, because that is the CSM. Should never have happened like that, but that's what it is. That's the CSM right there. First photograph, Magazine 37. No reticules in there on the reso plate. The ground is pristine. This is shot so-called just after they landed and we go along through all of magazine 37 do not have reticules in them so what we're going to do is we're going to scroll down a bit through them and we're going to see right here it doesn't take very long that we have footprints on the surface on this same magazine without reticules and of course they only got out one time and they only came back in. They were not going in and out. So when you're looking at this photograph, they're in it for the final time. The footprints are on the ground, which means the mission so-called is complete out there. So we've only gone in on this magazine. This is 5488 and we are at 5449 on this one. So now when we go through farther down on here, all of the photographs on 37 here are at the end of the mission shooting out the window. And you see the cameras out there, the flag is sitting there, you can note the position of the shadow, it basically stays the, the same. Here's the problem. You have to go back and look at the original list, the equipment list, because if they had one camera on there that had reticule and the other one that didn't, then you have a problem here. But if they didn't, it doesn't make sense why you would have two different cameras and these photographs would be one photo later, you'd have a reso plate and then the next photo you don't. Then the next photo, it's back again. And then three photos later, it's vanished. So yeah. how, how well, do they keep changing these cameras? The cameras are stated and documented that were on the lunar surface were thrown away. So if they had a camera with reso plates, and without reso plates, the camera on the lunar surface, which is magazine 40, has the reso plates in it. And that one's left on the lunar surface. And then here's just another shot of the showing at the end. And this is all magazine 37 right here. So now we're going to scroll up and we're going to get to magazine 39. Magazine 38 is all orbital photographs. Here's the very first photograph of magazine 39. Magazine 39, they have not been on the surface. There are no footprints out there, no reso plates. Then we come in to about 14 photographs in on Magazine 39. And then I'm going to scroll back. There's the previous photograph. This is 5749. And then the very next photograph, 5750, all of a sudden has reso plates. And as you can note, they have not been on the lunar surface in, in this photograph. This goes on. This is from 5750. Here's 5790. This is magazine 39. 5791. Nobody's on the lunar surface. The very next photograph. Reso plates are gone. All of this could have been done for editing. Why would they be changing cameras in and out during that? Nobody's been on the lunar surface through all of these. And there's 41 photographs with reticules in them. And then all of a sudden you get to here, and of course nobody's been on the lunar surface at this point. Then you get to 5793, two photos in when the 
reticules disappear. Nobody's been on the lunar surface. One more photograph, and now, because they're not getting in and out, they're in for the final time. There's the laser reflector, there's the footprints on the ground, one photograph later. Still on Magazine 39. So now you've got reso plates appearing, disappearing, everything's pristine, nobody's been on the surface, and now, all of a sudden, on the same magazine, if they were changing cameras, this is now the fourth change-up from pristine. They left that magazine, so-called, inside the thing, using one camera with reso plates, then without, then with reso plates, and now back without at the end of the mission. All on one magazine. That's the point. It's all on one magazine. That's a whole lot of screwing around. But then it keeps going through with a bunch of other photographs. Now, the other point being made, the cameras on the lunar surface. Buzz Aldrin apparently did not even bring a camera to the lunar surface, and that's almost an impossible. They must have been having some kind of an argument for him not to want to take a picture of Neil. But the three shots of Neil, two partial shots of him, and the other one, obviously, the other astronaut was using Neil's camera, Magazine 40. All of Magazine 40 has reso plates on it. So if the camera inside the lamp, which is a third camera that nobody talks about, does not have reso plates, number one, they were reducing weight before they took off. My understanding is that they threw all of the cameras out. That would mean that these photographs being taken in here were taken while the door was open. Then all the cameras were thrown out. They had it pressurized, it's in the video. They pressurize it and depressurize it, and they did not have contingency to do that. They did not have uh, extra material or oxygen or anything else to be able to do that. And they got in there, the raw video, the original so-called raw video, is they pressurize it up, they depressurize it, it only takes a couple seconds, and they open the door and they throw the PLSSs out. Every time they depressurize that, you're going to need more oxygen to repressurize it. You can't just pump in air. It has to be a mixture of gases. They so have to have the resources to do that, and the documents say that they only had enough to do with the one time. The weight restrictions on this machine were so intense. That's why they had mission specialists to reduce the entire weight on every part of the way. Every time they open that door, that means that all the atmosphere, all the oxygen's gone, and then they're going to have to fill that back up again. So every time they do this, uh, where's all this oxygen coming from? They didn't have the extra. That was the whole point. They didn't have the extra. And the other thing in Apollo 11, when you're looking at it, and here's just the typical, they're back on. They only exit to the ground and come back on once, and that is the biggest point. None of the photographs show the cameras on the ground that they threw out. None of the photographs show the PLSSs being thrown out. In the other missions, you can see them on the surface, so-called. And all of these photographs in 39 here, part of it is pristine before they got out, part of them has reticules, and they just keep switching this particular magazine so-called in and out of cameras, because some have reticules, some don't. At the end of this magazine, none of them have reticules back in them. There's nothing stated that there was this extra camera on board the lamp. They went down with two cameras with reticules on them. The one that wasn't used was Buzz Aldrin's. It was listed as having reticules on them. Both of them, they're using the reticules because they wanted to be able to map the... Uh, use it for measurements for the surface. The CSM obviously doesn't have reticules on because none of the photographs of them in there. Of course, that would be done in a separate location in a simulator in, in any kind of uh, hangar building or whatever where they had the simulator set up. Oh, by the way, see that hole right there? That nice round hole? And take a look at this sitting out. This is now upside down from that. That gets flipped upside down. Now, this is right on the line, right at this 
divide here and it is no longer there it's not there they've kicked it in and that other photograph shows that it was kicked in there's the bag right see where the bag is actually this piece right here should be sitting right there gone completely regroomed there's the bag across to it the bag across to the shadow right this is gone and that's what I said that other photograph when it comes in here kicked upside down there is another one of the horizon here see the size of that rock that ain't it actually it looks kind of close maybe it is on the angle but that other rock where it's all busted open there showing all the junk that's inside of it they're intentionally doing that that's a beautiful shot right out there just right to that can't go any further than that can you nope and then you've got this way the hell out is it an angle on there or not but you see what they did on this rock here that's the same rock they came in and they chopped the hell out of it to open all this up to show all the stuff that's inside of it what they were doing in Apollo 11 was very subtle compared to the rest of the missions the one from March to the Moon actually have a few more details up there and then you're going to get into rocks that look like this which I don't know what it is but it sure is not a rock there's a pipe sticking out of here another pipe sticking there all kinds of stuff you can see over here look at that I almost think those are big tires or something sitting back there perfectly round hole that piece right in there that whatever kind of a casing it is but March to the Moon because <laughs> they put a larger format picture in right and of course this is a silhouette of an astronaut saluting you who knows look at this rocker look at this thing right here have you ever seen anything like that and of course they managed to put everything's basically on the same angle when they're doing this stuff too so they were having fun on the set when they were building it look at the stuff on here the bands on top of the piping and stuff and just continues on look at this casing here that's a got to be a transmission case that whole section down there is landfill yeah well you see the babies right there that is just hilarious yeah look at look at the beautiful shape around there the little carrying case for your little baby to and I imagine uh, somebody would look and say hey I used to buy one of those for my grandkids right well, the funny thing is, is the hairstyle on that doll is... 1960s, like everything was just plastic, there was no hair. But when you see this particular rock here, and of course we've looked at it, how it's all messed up, that just can't happen. It's not just camera angle, it's not anything else. This thing has been cut open and a piece of metal pulled out of it and stuff in that other photograph. Here there, right to the edge of the set could be the angle but there's not a whole lot of set there and if we look at Gary's video Gary is able to distill it in a way where he says that any film tech should look at the photographic record and say there's something off here there's something weird about this and that's key because if you're a real film technician you would feel that there's something off if you had the real worry of financial implosion because you're trying to control the film which is ultimately your product you can't have exposure errors you can't even afford exposure errors I only yeah. had one competitor in Southeast Asia and that was a multi-billionaire it doesn't matter to him whether he blows a roll of film it matters to me if I blow a roll of film because I can't afford to keep buying film I just can't I mean I'm literally on an edge where if I don't control it's just a funny coincidence if I grew up wealthy we wouldn't be having this conversation possibly because that fear that I felt, that worry, that's those sleepless nights of worrying about, you know, 20 cans of 2,000 foot rolls of film that are sitting in my building while I'm trying to sleep at home and I'm worried that the air conditioning is going to stop, that I can't control the cool room or something and it's happened in the past. See why I'm afraid, why I'm worried? My competitor has 300 staff and there's always somebody 24 hours a day to look after their film and even if he loses a roll of film it means nothing I'm dealing with food that can go off essentially you see it's quite interesting the technical skills that you have to have 
just to handle the film. Yes, it is. Like, I'll put it to you this way. The chemist in the film laboratory that I would have to talk to every day and the person in the control department that I would have to talk to every day, it's very possible that they've never, ever shot one still image on a camera in their life. They don't need to. What they need to think about is control and chemical control. They don't even need to have a love of film. They don't need to care about lenses or shutter speeds or anything like that. They, in fact, they may never have shot one image in their entire life. They may not even know how to handle a camera. I mean, it's unlikely, but if they didn't, it's not part of their skill set to know that stuff. What they need to know is how to control a film laboratory, make sure the chemistry is stable. They have to chart it every few hours. They've got to make sure that everything is within certain tolerances in the, in the film processing machine. You're talking about having to control the environment around that film. You're concerned about the barometric pressure, dust in the room, the temperature, the humidity, as well as random radiation that could be waving through the building. So you need a Faraday cage to work with as well. Well, we didn't know we needed a Faraday cage until I got to a point in my career where we couldn't explain what these exposure errors were. It made no sense that it could be the film recorder. It just made no sense. It was so weird and all we could put it down to was cosmic rays. And that's why I was told by the chemist that the only thing that he could see how those exposures got on the film and ruined my film and so I didn't have a product to sell. Essentially, I'm putting the best stake money can buy I'm about to cook it for the Prime Minister of Canada. And every time I'm about to bring it to the plate, I can't do it. So he's thinking, who's this Scott guy that I'm sitting down in his Michelin star uh, restaurant, and every time I want the best steak, and I hear Scott's the best, you see the point? I can't eat the steak. And that was what was happening to me. And we ruled everything out. We ruled out the fridge that was ruining the steak. We ruled out where the animal was killed. I mean, all of the, the chain to get to that state to the plate for the Prime Minister of Canada, to put it in your thinking, we ruled everything out. The only thing we had left was cosmic rays. And, and I can't say that in my career, I've only ever seen this problem once. So for years and years and years, we were using film and people use films without Faraday cages. You don't walk into a film laboratory and see Faraday cages everywhere. You don't, it's not a norm, not a technical norm in our industry. It was a solution to try and solve this problem. And all I can tell you is that once we started using Faraday Cage technology, those issues went away. Now, they could have gone away for two reasons. One, because of Faraday Cage, or two, because the cosmic rays that we happened to experience at that time happened to sensitise the emulsion in a certain way to give those certain things. And that may be the only time in history that was ever going to happen. We will never know. But I didn't want to take that risk again because I couldn't risk it. Because if that kept happening to me, I consider this, right? If I'm shooting out a whole motion picture at 120 minutes in length, that's a massive amount of film. And it's not just the cost of the film. It's the energy and the time, the film processing. It's the screenings that you have to do, the interaction with the clients. I mean, there's a whole massive amount of energy that goes into just producing a print off the negative that I'm responsible for, the negative film stock that I'm responsible for, and getting that negative film stock processed and clean and looking as best as possible. See, in the past, a film lab was a film lab, and all the specialists were allowed to work. So all our specialists would say, okay, the film lab is not gonna try and do what we're doing because they specialize in the chemistry. We are the, the special technical creative people. We'll produce our product, and then we can trust that we can take our work to the film chemical building and those guys, that's all they're going to do. A Faraday cage is to stop random radiation, whether it's coming from the earth or a piece of equipment or anything else in there. Yeah. And when you buy a piece of hardware today or computer or circuit boards or whatever, that little package in it has a Faraday cage around it. And so they're much more robust a piece of a circuit board or whatever is much more robust and should be able to handle it. And yet, when it's shipped to you, it has a Faraday cage around it. That plastic pouch has the electrical wiring in it. They're very concerned, aren't they? The only reason why I found out about Michael Faraday was because of that incident. I didn't know what a Faraday cage was at that time. I can't know everything. 
all we knew was is that the technician that built my studio told me, Tim, have you considered a Faraday cage? And I said, what's that? I don't know what it is. Because we've never used Faraday cages in the film industry, at least not in my experience, and I'm at the top level in my field, in my area, in my part of the world. So a Faraday cage was just nothing that we would consider. Once I started to understand the concept of it, now I had to focus on it because it meant that if I don't have something to stop these problems, I can't run my business, I can't meet my deadlines, and my business is finished, and I'm in big trouble. When you're talking about the film and the emulsion, the Saturn V rocket taking off, launching, putting out more than 205 decibels, the sound and vibration of that engine taking off vibrates the air so rapidly that it actually makes the sky light up. Now, what happens to an emulsion if you subject it to a vibration that is running 180,000 cycles per second? I mean, that vibration will liquefy a human being. What about the film? It's on board. It's vibrating like that. That sound volume is going to expose the film. I mentioned this before, and you would have known about this yourself anyway during your own investigations, but one of the problems that we would have is pressure fogging. So whenever we take a brand new roll of film out of the can, I've got to touch it with my hands, right? That's why we have leader. We have so much leader. There's a whole lot of wastage at the start. And when we get the film back, you can see my fingers and everything just touching the film. Because even light touching will pressure fog it. No light at all. That little bit just squeezing the emulsion. Yes. Yes. And so when you (laughs) subject a film to a vacuum and then back into pressure in a vacuum, it's going to do the same thing and fog it. But worse, but much worse. What happens if you vibrate it? I mean, it's like me doing this a million times with my finger. If I can just take the film and hold it like this and then put it in the film process and you see my thumbs, that's just a simple pressure fog. That's happened to me millions of times. So a sound wave is reacting through it is going to make a small movement in the emulsion the same as yeah. radiation does. It's all the same as what my desktop speakers, my studio speakers here. The same thing is moving. The cones of the woofers are moving. The tweet is moving slightly at certain frequencies because it's sound. I mean, it's pushing. It's pressure. We're talking about a concentrated pressure, you know? And right. so if I take my finger and I press it, like I've got to hold the film, but I've always got to be very careful. Because even though you know that you've got some wastage at the front of the head of the film and on the leader, you still don't want to get into the habit of being rough with that because it means that you've always got to be careful. Because I've been around film since I was a kid, you learn to be gentle with it by default. You know, you have to be gentle with the leader, with the head leaders, with the tail leaders, because it means that you are constantly by default always being gentle. Once the film is shot and I put latent image exposures on it, there's a danger now that not only have I had to preserve the emulsion ready for a latent image exposure, then I've got to transport it to the film laboratory and run it through the chemical processor. And this is all a, a process of control. Every step of the way, from the second that I get the film out of the, the cool truck from the couriers, right, into my cool room, I mean, the whole thing is a control thing. It just seems to me that that whole control process is thrown away when they go to the moon. Where's the control? That's why I say to Gary, you can talk about S-stops, and you can talk about shutter speed, you can talk about all this stuff, but Gary's point that made me make that comment was real film techs would ask themselves, really, there's something weird about this, and you do, and he's really succinctly got that right. In a few words, he's distilled exactly how Marcus thinks. Essentially, that's what Marcus is saying. There's something weird about this, and I'm questioning the record. That's all Marcus is doing, if you distill the whole thing down. Forget about all the technical stuff he talks about. I'm doing the same thing. I'm saying, well, how come I'm walking on eggshells with film? I'm worried all the time. I'm working for myself. If I don't handle that film properly, I'm in big trouble. So how come they're not worried about it in an environment where you can't control it? Please, with 969 film stock technology? That's all I can say. For me, it's the enough said moment because I know what it's like to have that feeling. You know, there's all these other things, shadows, you know, perfectly framed and all this. None of that means anything to me. I mean, it does. And all the stuff you found, it, and it's all crucial and important. But I think the most important thing, and Gary picks up on it, is very simple, is the feel, it's the control. You didn't use that term, but I use that term because in the film laboratory, we have the control department, as you know. 
Here's the other thing about the film, the magazine. The ones that are on the outside of the CSM are there. The mapping camera and everything else that are on the outside of the CSM. Those magazines are there from launch. They're not inside a capsule that is pressurized at any given time. They have to go through the entire launch sequence through all the atmospheric rapid changes in temperature when yeah. they're moving through there, right through the Van Allen belts. Yeah. Right? And they don't pick them up for nine days. That's when they can bring them back in the capsule. They do that EVA so, walk. Essentially, if Tim is afraid of how the film is going to be transported to my studio on Earth, the Saturn V, we could liken it to a courier. It's couriering astronauts, apparently. It's couriering rocket fuel. It's also couriering a batch of film stuff. Is that in a cool room somewhere? Where is that? There is equipment <laughs> that's on the outside of the craft. There's equipment that's in the descent stage of the LEM, which is also yes. outside of the craft the entire way. By the time that that film would get there, unless it's not being transported in some kind of cool room without any chance of vibrations or pressure fogging or heat fogging if it's not being protected by a faraday cage maybe the saturn 5 its frame is a folder faraday cage i don't know i don't think it is i had discussions with somebody else about it, i can't remember but the point is is that if we just consider the Saturn V is a courier delivering film to the film studio, the film studio is Tim's studio on the moon, how do I know that that film, by the time it gets to me and I put my first latent image exposure on it, that that film's going to be any good until I get it back to Earth, put it in a film processing machine and see what the result is? We don't see any strange aberrations. We don't see any of that. The only weird footage that we see about what was shot on film is only the fact that they just kept shooting it and shooting and shooting and shooting it image transform just to degrade the pictures. But if they would give us the opportunity looking at the original negatives, we're not going to see things like what I experienced, like cosmic ray exposures and things like that, and that's going to prove that they never went anywhere. It's as simple as that. that. 